So we're going to do a quick little linear algebra review because, of course, everything in machine learning is either a matrix or a vector. We're going to need a couple of different things from linear algebra. We're going to need the usual kinds of vector addition and matrix addition. We're going to use the dot product a lot. The dot product is the projection of one vector onto another, and the output of it is a scalar number. We're going to talk about matrix multiplication. And right now, I'm going to talk about the Hadamard product, which we're going to need rarely. And I'm not going to go into it in any more detail right now. But just to mention, if we have two vectors, then we can multiply them element-wise and get an output the same size as the two vectors, where the first element of the output is the first element of vector A multiplied by the first element of vector B, okay, so on and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about Hadamard product again in more detail when we do need it, but again, it's going to be rarely used in general. However, the rest of this stuff, well, we need to know it. So let's take a look at vector representations and get familiar with notation. So this means our vector A, we're always going to show vectors as boldface, almost always at least, when I'm paying attention. Okay, boldface means it's a vector. It's a three-dimensional vector. You should read this notation as A is in the vector space R3. R3 means three-dimensional vector space. This superscript 3 means three-dimensional. And the R means the vector space is real numbered. So this number, you know, Y, whatever it is, it's a real number. Okay, takes an infinite number of possible values as we go back and forth across Y. So, R3, three-dimensional vector space of reals. A is in that three-dimensional vector space. So, A has three dimensions. So, vector A is composed of an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. Now, we will sometimes talk about unit vectors. So in the x direction, we have this unit vector here, i. i is 1 long. OK, so if we do that, the length of the vector i is 1. OK, likewise, we have j, which is also 1 long, but it's 1 long in the y direction. So we will sometimes talk about unit vectors. But vector A, vector A is not one long. We can see that very clearly from those projections. So when we look, write down A, we're going to write it down like this. Probably most of the time we're going to have these column vectors. That is, you know, we're going to stack it up like that in a column. And the X component and the Y component and the Z component, those projections, those lengths, which we can see are bigger than one, well, they're going to go a x here, uh, a y, it's going to go there, a z there. All right. Now, the overall length of that vector has to be bigger than one. How can we get the overall length? Well, you probably remember the Pythagorean theorem, right? So the square root of the sum of squares of the sides is equal to the hypotenuse. So there we go. That is the hypotenuse of our triangle in three dimensions. And so we can use that same kind of Pythagorean theorem and get what's called the vector magnitude. So this is a vector norm. So when we see something, anything that looks like two lines and a vector inside it, that's a vector norm. It's saying, hey, how long is that vector? Now, there are different kinds of vector norms. 
you can call this one the L2 norm. Note that two, okay? That L2 norm is also called the Euclidean norm. All right, so in general, we can write other vector norms, not just the L2, not just the Euclidean norm. We can take that number n and we can make it any number at all. We can generalize our Euclidean norm with the Pythagorean theorem here to any n. So an L1 norm, well, and just adding up the sides. The L1 norm is sometimes used in machine learning. Okay, an L3 norm would be the cubes of the sides and then the cube root. So all these things are possible vector norms. In general, most of the time we're talking about the Euclidean norm, so sometimes we'll just drop that too, and that implicitly means the Euclidean norm. Okay, vector addition. Just a quick reminder, vector addition is super easy. We've got two vectors. If they are the same size, only if they're the same size, we can add them together. And we just element-wise put x with x, y with y, and we get this. It's just worth remembering how that geometrically plays out. If we have a plus b, well, all we got to do is kind of shift a over so that its tail is, is on the point of B, and then follow those two together, and we get to A plus B. Okay, so we make the triangle out of them. Dot product. The dot product is a scalar projection. So I like to think of this as the sundial. So if we have a sun up here, this is my really great sun art. And it's going to hit this um, sundial, right? We're going to pretend A is a sundial. Well, A is going to cast a shadow onto B. So that's where the shadow lies, right? And that projection, right, because it is a projection, you're projecting like shining a light source of A and seeing where its shadow is on B. That projection is called the dot product. A dot B, well, mathematically, that's the two vectors, A and B, their overall sizes, their magnitudes, multiplied by each other, multiplied by the cosine of the angle in between the vectors. Right? So theta is this angle inside here. So you can kind of see how that works. Cosine, you'll remind yourself, that's the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Well, A is the hypotenuse. So the magnitude of A is going to cancel with that, and we're just left with the adjacent side there. OK, so this is the dot product, A dot B. We have multiple notations. I apologize for mathematicians who just can't seem to stick with one notation. So a dot b, this is just an alternate notation for a dot b. You will sometimes see that. Hey, guess what? You can make a dot product out of a matrix multiplication, a transpose b. a transpose b is going to produce the same thing as a dot product. This is matrix multiplication. This is a dot product. The dot product is a special thing that is not matrix multiplication, but we can use matrix multiplication to produce the dot product. Okay, now you're sitting there going, I've forgotten how matrix multiplication works. Well, let me show you. Um, so if we have two vectors, A and B, one's a row vector, one's a column vector, and we multiply A times B, well, just a reminder, the first of the two vectors is going to tell you 
how many rows your output gets. And the second of the two vectors is going to tell you how many columns your output gets. Well, right now we have one row and one column, so the output is a scalar. Right? So we just go tick a1 times b1, a2 times b2, a3 times b3, and we add all of that together. That produces a single scalar number. Now, matrix multiplication is not commutative. A times B is not the same thing as B times A. And you can very much see that in this case because three rows in the first multiplying position means we get three rows in the output. And three columns in the second multiplying position that means we get three columns in the output. So the output of BA is a three by three matrix, whereas AB is a scalar. Okay, and we just go down the rows and columns, matching them up, right? That produces the first column there. And then we do it again and again and again sorry my bad <laughs> i can't remember how to do this right that produces the first column and then we do the second column and then we do the third column okay So, how does it work with matrices? Same deal. First element tells us how many rows. Second element tells us how many columns. So that produces a two by two matrix. Two rows, two columns. Okay, so why do we use vectors? Vectors represent variables. We are often gonna take our inputs and we're going to use a particular data point and represent it as a vector. So if we've got, um, I don't know, maybe this is a, an enemy fighter jet that we are tracking. Okay, so this one particular fighter jet, I'm going to call it fighter jet A, it's got a position in three-dimensional space and it's got a speed in each one of the three dimensions. Okay? And we're going to represent the location and velocity of that fighter jet as a vector. And our machine learning system is going to try to, I don't know, predict where it's going to be so we can shoot it down. All right? Maybe you're trying to do some sort of housing machine learning where we're trying to predict uh, whether or not a house is going to sell. Okay, well, let's get some data for it. We can put the house price, okay, the year it's built, square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, and put that in a vector. So let's take a look at what we got here. Everything in this first uh, vector is a real number, right? So this is a six-dimensional real vector space. Now, you could use real numbers here. Price, year built, square footage, blah, blah. Or, really, you could say, except for square footage, maybe, but you could say these are integer numbers, right? These are the so-called natural numbers. So, natural numbers is how mathematicians call integers. We can say that's a uh, natural number space. Okay, what about something like a car? Well, a car can have a make, a model, year built, engine displacement, blah blah, color. Now we have something a little different. Make, well, I don't know how many car manufacturers there are in the world, but it's certainly less than a hundred. It's a small discrete number. 
So this is not a real valued or numeric vector space. These are categories. There are a small discrete number of possibilities. Chevy, Ford, Volkswagen, right? Likewise, models are also categories. Color is also probably a category. There's probably a discrete number of possibilities and a relatively small and countable set. So categories have to be represented a little bit differently. Let's talk a bit about that in the context of an animal, where we can measure things about the animal. So here we have sparrow, chipmunk, bat. A sparrow flies, it lays eggs, it's got this kind of weight. Bat flies, but it does not lay eggs, and it's quite a bit lighter than the sparrow. Okay, how are we going to represent these? Two ways to represent categorical data. We can either put the category itself into the vector. So this is a mix of real number and categorical uh, inputs here. In this case, flying is, well, you know, it's either is flying or it's not flying we can encode that as a Boolean, right? As true or false. That is, there's only two possible answers here. It does fly or it doesn't fly. So we can put Boolean variables in with numeric variables and represent Sparrow like this. Okay, and bat is going to be represented like this. We have the true and the false for flies, yes, lays eggs, no. All right, let me show you an alternate version. This is called one hot encoded. What we have to do is say this part here that's flies. And this part here, that's lays eggs. There are two possibilities for each one of those. There is a true and a false. So however many categories there are, you need to have one position per category. Now, right now we're dealing with Boolean variables, so there's only true and false positions. But what if we are doing a car, right, instead of the animals, and our car has um, make, which is one of VW, Ford, or Chevy. So three. So a car, uh, we're going to call it Jason's car. Man, I can't even spell my own name today. That's really sad. Um, so Jason's car is whatever else other variables we're talking about here. In the middle, we've got a representation that says VW, somewhere in there for the make. So that would be a category encoded version of Jason's car. What would a one hot encoded version of Jason's car look like? Well, so there's three possible makes. So we're gonna need three possible locations. So there's gonna be um, if we're going to put VW first, then it's going to be a one followed by two zeros, where this is the VW position, this is the Ford position, and this is the, che the Chevy position. Okay, so one hot encoding means however many possibilities there are, there are that many positions, 
and only one of them, mutually exclusive categories, only one of those positions can be hot, can have a one, and the rest have to be zeros. Okay, that's it. We've got you far enough along to start up with lecture on Wednesday. See you then.